Welcome back. Welcome back. Today has already been everything. We are going to keep the energy, the encouragement, the inspiration going. So excited about this next panel. We knew we could not do a Black Women's Wellness Day without intentionally focusing on our mental well-being. We were very excited um, to find this amazing group of women, Black Mental Wellness, that will be hosting this next session, Cultivating the Wellness We Deserve. We are joined today by two of the co-founders, Dr. Nicole Kamek and Dr. Daniel Bugsby. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about these absolutely um, amazing women that I have had the opportunity to meet just most recently. You guys are gonna be blessed by this session. Uh, Dr. Nicole was born and raised in Richmond, Virginia. I know I can hear Lisa in the other room snapping her fingers up, raising the roof for uh, Richmond. She currently resides in Washington, D.C., where she received her bachelor's degree in psychology with a minor in human development from Howard University, her master's degree and Ph.D. in clinical psychology from George Washington University. Additionally, she completed a specialized postdoctoral fellowship with the Center for School Mental Health at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. She is a licensed clinical psychologist in the state of Maryland, and she currently serves as the program director of the Primary Care Mental Health Integration Clinic, where she provides mental health services to veterans in co-located primary care settings. You will soon find out she is obviously very passionate about mental health awareness, treatment, reducing uh, stigma, in particular as it relates to the Black community. We are in uh, for a treat today. And this is the passion is what led to the development of Black mental wellness. And for, for Janine, this is for you, sis. She is also an active member of the Delta Sigma Theta sorority. So she is in the house. Welcome. We are also here with Dr. Danielle, born and raised in Detroit, Michigan. Shout out Detroit and raised in the Detroit metropolitan area. She received her BA in psychology from the University of Michigan. That's where my daughter went. Go blue. And her master's and PhD in clinical psychology from George Washington University. Dr. Bugsby completed her pre-doctoral internship with a child trauma specialization at Duke's University's Medical Center. Additionally, she completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Michigan Medicine and the Department of Psychiatry, where she was awarded recipient of the National Institute of Mental Health Research Supplement to promote diversity. Y'all know you are quite uh, licensed and credentialed. Um, she also takes incredible pride in the mission and collaborative spirit of the Black Mental Wellness. And shout out again, also an active member of the Delta Sigma Theta sorority. So welcome both of you. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are so excited for what you have in store for us. And I am going to pass the stage off to you. Thank you, thank you for that amazing introduction. It is so good to be here today um, to follow up after so many amazing sessions. Um, so I'm gonna just pass it off to Dr. Kamek to really just tell us a little bit more about Black Mental Wellness specifically, and then we're gonna jump right in. Yeah, so again, thank you all for having us. Um, we are from Black Mental Wellness. We are a organization that is um, consists of four clinical psychologists, and we really got together to shift how we think about mental health in the Black community. So we actually, it's for Black women, um, and we saw that there was a need for more resources specific to Black people, and we got together to do that. So we have a website, they're putting the information up that has a ton of information about mental health, um, different disorders, coping and wellness strategies, uh, resources, books, all types of things that you can find and across the lifespan. So from resources from children through adults. Um, we also do things with the mentorship. So if there are any students out there who are looking to do a career in mental health, we have a mentorship program. We have an internship program where we work with students and trainees to prepare them for um, a career in mental or behavioral health. And then lastly, we like to um, work with different 
organizations and companies and do events like this so that we really can be connected to our community in so many different ways. So thank you all for having us. I want to shout out to all my sorors who are lighting the chat up. We love you for that. <laughs> so we can get started. Absolutely. And then I'm just going to add one additional thing that's really important to us that we really want to decrease the stigma around mental health and mental health treatment specifically in the black community. So we hope that today's you know panel and our engagement will allow us to begin to do that. And so I just want to just give a, a heads up that if, if you know you're going to be active in this session to get something to write with have some sort of paper and pad or you know, have a, a document up on your computer if you're gonna be using that because we want you to walk away with some tangibles and we're gonna be having some reflective experiences. So we'll be using the chat primarily as a way to engage, but we want you to have your own personal way of really note taking and keeping track of how you kind of wanna implement a very intentional way to make your mental, mental well being a priority um, after today's session. So I wanna give people time to do that. Um, but I also want us to kind of jump into that first question that we want to ask the group. And, you know, in thinking about how do we cultivate well-being, mental well-being specifically, we thought it would be really appropriate to start today by just asking you all, what do we deserve as Black women? Right? When you, when you hear that question, I think sometimes you may feel taken aback sometimes because when people ask me kind of like, what do I deserve? It's like, wait, we're thinking about me? And it's like, yes, that's what our intention is going to be today. We want to really focus on ourselves and we want to focus on our well-being and our mental well-being specifically. So when you hear that question asked, what do we deserve as Black women? Please put in the chat what, what comes to mind, what thoughts you have. I love it. Mental health, here I come. Okay, peace, mm -hmm. comfort, ease. I love someone said ease because that's, that's been my theme for the year. I deserve ease, peace of mind, rest, rest. joy. I was in um, a meeting uh, recently and a black woman said, I need a soft place to land. And the way that that just spoke to me, it was like, so in so many of uh, the settings that we're in, we have to sort of come in and, you know, do all the things. And so sometimes just having that place to, be soft and not have to be on and just rest is everything. Equal. Oh, you all are coming with it. it. To thrive in all things, peace mm -hmm. of mind, to be respected, therapy and vacations, absolutely. Peace of mind, love, compassion, a acceptance. Soft place to land, acceptance, freedom to pursue the things I'm interested in, sunshine. My boundaries being respected. Love that from that power. Yes, that would that statement, it sort of made me take a breath when she said it, like, oh, you've summed up so beautifully what it's like or what we need. Respect, trust, me time. Love. I love that you all are um, being so active and engaged because oftentimes it's hard for people to think about what is it that they even need. So to hear so or to see so many black women coming up with what it is that we deserve um, is beautiful. Right. Yeah, so right. <laughs> Financial security, be accepted in all my complexity. That's a great one. That's a really good one. Happiness. And being able to define what the happiness is without judgment from other people. Something that comes to my mind personally is also just freedom. Like sometimes I feel like there's such restrictions on how you're supposed to act and how people are going to receive you if you act this way, if we're thinking about corporate spaces sometimes. So just freedom to be myself. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I see some people agreeing with that. Opportunities, authentic friendships, my space. My space. Yes. So it seems like a lot of us are really naming things that we all can mutually agree with. We all have a, a general understanding, freedom to express myself without being labeled an angry black woman. That's definitely. Can we just pause on that? <laughs> like, <laughs> agree there for sure. Yes. Self love, love loving um, kindness, emotional wellness, liberation. I'm also wondering too, just like to hear that question, how did it feel? Did it feel like 
something just because we're in the conference, you know, I'm ready to kind of explore that. Or does it feel foreign? Because I know for me, sometimes it feels foreign when people ask me like what I deserve or what do I need? And that was data for me about just the fact that I don't know if I always feel like I have space to even express a need. A balanced life of joy, family and great work. Mm -hmm. I would imagine, I would say for myself while we're waiting for the chat to come up, it, that it probably would depend on who was asking the question or the setting mm -hmm. of how I would feel about the question. So in some settings, it may not feel authentic. So I may not feel pulled to give the truth or, or feeling like it mattered, like someone said. But when you're in certain places or someone, depending on who's asking the question, if it feels authentic, it does give you that space to say, okay, let me think about this. So I love these responses. Yeah, I wanted to say, well, I don't know because I'm always giving care out, right? Um, kind of, actually, someone said equitable access to resources. It feels like I matter. To be asked this feels like I'm cared for deeply. It makes me feel noticed. And Dr. Kamek, I definitely agree with that, that depending on who asked, and it was in a, mm -hmm. a professional setting where I was asked that and I was actually having to take leave for something that was happening related to my family. And I was coming to give all the plans I had for all my patients and what we were going to do with me being absent. And he just kind of paused and said, but what do you need? And I was just taking wow. that. I was like, what, mm -hmm. you, what? Like, you don't need to know all the plans because what happens if I'm not here? You sometimes feel like things are going to just fall apart um, without your presence. So, Or that you have to justify why you need something. So sometimes it's just beautiful to be able to express it and you don't have to justify why I need it. I'm human. I'm a woman. I'm asking for it. I'm stating it. And so in that moment, it sounds like he was able to see you as a person mm -hmm. without all of that. Cause I do that too. When I got to take time, it's like, okay, let me explain why. Like, no, I just need it. Well, now I don't do that anymore, but. But a different version of our different. Oh my goodness. Yes. Honestly, it's hard to embrace what you deserve when you so often are focused on helping others get what they deserve. I deserve it at all times. Sometimes it feels foreign to me because society seems to expect for us to be slash feel even grateful to occupy the spaces we currently occupy, especially thinking about work in professional spaces. Um, I don't get upset anymore when someone calls me an angry black woman. I just tell them to add the word justified. <laughs> Yes, to be seen as a person, not a role. No excuses. Absolutely. I mm -hmm. love this. I love this. And I think the, you know, the context of things matter. And I hear people say, because I'm here with Black women, I feel cared about and seen, right? And so really, how do we create that for ourselves, no matter what the context is, right? Like, how do we um, name and, and claim what we deserve, no matter what the context is? Mm -hmm. And so this kind of brings me to that next question that we have for the group. Get what you deserve, beautiful, amazing Black women. Yes, love at Justify Angry Black Woman. I love it. I love the activity in the chat. So then my next question for the group is, so we've talked about what we deserve as Black women, but now this is a different question. I want to know what's getting in the way of what you deserve. If you reflect on that for a moment, what's getting in the way of what you deserve? And I'm going to be honest, I'll be the first one to say, sometimes it's myself, right? Sometimes it's absolutely myself getting in the way. I see a comment here. Thank you. It says white supremacy, patriarchy, capitalism. Absolutely. Fear and time. Mm -hmm. And something I'll add is, is sometimes the systems, the way things are set up, Black women are not always given the space or the tools or the words or the respect to get what they deserve, we deserve. And so sometimes you can't even, it's like you're having to make an, a complete shift. So as you said earlier, like this whole version of who I am now is very different from who I was and I'm constantly learning. And even when I am speaking up, there's still this sort of like underlying like, ooh, how is this gonna be taken? And so sometimes that can get in the way. But if we're saying, hey, I deserve this or I want to do these things, we have to figure out how to feel the fear or those things in the moment and do it anyway or ask for it anyway or hold people accountable um, in those ways. And I'm going to read you some of the chat. It mm -hmm. says not being paid what I'm worth 
I need to prioritize myself and my time, others, fear. I tend to put others before me, patriarchy and self-doubt. My own mind, myself, I elect to be busy. I can't sit my butt down, right? But I think, you know, I think all of these things work together, right? Like the systems in which we exist in, how those things make us show up, how those things make us think about ourselves and what we deserve or what we should take or have to endure before we can kind of get to the what we deserve. I think sometimes that's a narrative we create, right? Like I have to endure a lot before I get to deserve X, Y, and Z instead of I just deserve it, period, right? Our social our socialization gets in the way often, absolutely. Past treatment, right? I've been treated this way in the past, so I expect that I have to continue to be treated this way. Being willing to accept less than I, than I deserve. Me, I'm always busy and taking care of others. Try to plan self-care. Thinking too much about the obstacles and not the reward. Mm -hmm. And I also think that um, society sometimes tells us as women or as Black women what we should do, like what it takes to be a good Black woman, a strong Black woman, a certain type of mother, a certain type of partner. And so we end up buying into these ways of thinking that don't always serve us. And so when I'm seeing like put people before us, like it's almost like people will be like, oh, you're such a good person. Like, look at you putting everyone before yourself. And the other side of that is what are you losing in the process? People don't see that part or they don't acknowledge it or they can even sometimes make it feel like it's selfish to do that. And so then you begin to feel like, well, I don't wanna be selfish. I don't want people to think I'm not a good person. And it's like, well, who said that that is what it even is? And how can you find that way of, you know, taking that time to touch in into what you need, what you deserve, what you want, so that you can even figure out, is this even what I want to do? Like we end up taking on all the pressures of society, what our, everyone else wants, and then you lose yourself in the process. And for so, for so many Black women who come to therapy, that's where they are. They sort of come in and it's like, I'm everything to everyone else. And then I ask the question, well, who are you to you? They can't answer it because you give in to these demands. And so I like the uh, comment about take the power. Like, how do we take our power back? It's not up to someone else to tell me what I deserve, but I can put in things to say, hey, this is what I'm going to get. And if I can't get it, I'm going to you know, walk away or I'm going to go where I can get it or I'm going to give it to myself. You can't stop me from doing that piece. Right. And when I talk to a lot of black women, when we talk about what gets in the way, I do hear a lot of things about time. I hear a lot of things about logistics. I hear a lot of things about um, just kind of like financial aspects mm -hmm. come up, right? Like I don't have the time to do this or I need to be working or it kind of comes back to being about other people, right? And and like you said, Dr. K, like this idea of it's being selfish, like mm -hmm. taking care of myself is somehow construed as being selfish. But I never really hear people have the same narrative about when others take care of themselves that it, it means that they're selfish, right? Or like I'm talking to friends and they're like, oh, well, you know, my, my husband has to go to his basketball game every Tuesday. And I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Like, he makes time for the things that are really important for him. And that doesn't get, you know, construed as being selfish. But when you want to do something that's really about you and it's about taking a couple hours out of your week, it's like, wait, you have to do all these other tasks. And it's because like, you're a woman. Indeed. <laughs> Yes, it says you're speaking of something so important. We're often raised with so much expectation to take care of the whole, with no consideration of self. Then we prioritize self. We're shamed for being selfish or a free agent. Mm -hmm. You're shamed mm -hmm. for it, right? And the idea, really, when we think about self-care, I think sometimes we have these very elaborate ideas of bubble baths and massages, and I am a proponent of both of those things, right? However, when we talk about self-care from a very intentional standpoint, it doesn't need to be this, like, this this one day that you take out to do this luxurious set of, of things, right? It's really about what are your intentional everyday strategies, weekly strategies that incorporate time, intentionality about your wellness and well-being. Because we, you know, I know we often hear the statement like you can't pour from an empty cup, right? 
So we can't be trying to like give to everyone else and we're on E because one, what we're going to give is going to be limited. It's not going to be our, our most authentic self. It's not going to be the best version of what we could be giving. And we're going to wear ourselves down that what happens if you, if you, if you're not able to show up anymore. Right. So I think it's selfish to, to do so much draining of yourself that, you know, you have all these responsibilities for other people. Yeah. We want to make sure that's important and that's taken care of. But what happens if you aren't capable anymore? What happens if you run yourself thin? And then then what happens to everyone else? And so people need to really get to shift our narrative for how we think about self-care and that me taking care of myself is me taking care of the collective, is me taking care of the whole. I'm a part of the whole, right? And I clearly have really important responsibilities within this piece of things. And so, and so sometimes that means creating those boundaries that people are going to push up against. They're not going to like them if they don't equal, I don't get my way exactly the way I want to. And I've had to tell my family, friends, partners, these things in ways that, that it's not always a comfortable conversation. But I really try to help people see this is because I love you too. I also love me. So if I love me, I got to show me that I love me in the same way that I want to show you that I love you. And so I see the chat going off. Well, I want to say something about what you said, um, Danielle, because um, when you when you talked about making those boundaries, Danielle is real good about boundaries. So y'all listen to her. <laughs> yes, yes you, you are good. <laughs> but, but one thing about boundaries is like as we're talking about this and as you're doing something a different way, the people around you aren't used to that, right? They're used to being able to either get you to say yes, or they know how to like push the button. So then you finally like, okay, I'll do it. And so you have to, as you said, like be aware of that and maintain those boundaries and people will adjust. So it's going to feel uncomfortable at first, but over time, or maybe it always feels uncomfortable to an extent, but over time, it should be easier for you and the people around you begin to learn, okay, that's a boundary. I'm going to back off from that. It says, my favorite thing I heard about boundaries is that you reinforcing your boundaries is your attempt to keep that relationship. Mm. Absolutely. Your attempt to keep it in the most healthy form so that it can exist across time, right? I agree with that wholeheartedly, Erin. Like, I feel like if we are willing to just take, 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 and you know that that relationship eventually will fall apart if you continue to take in a way that doesn't honor both people, then that's like, I don't care enough about this relationship to do the work. This is me doing the work. And and it can be lovingly. It doesn't have to be harsh. It doesn't mean that people are going to receive it well each time. I've and, I, and I've learned that the boundaries are hardest with the people you love. I had to set a boundary with my father. And that's like my favorite human in the world. And I was like, daddy, that's just not how we can go anymore. Like, I know we've been doing it that way for a long time, but it has to shift because I can't do it anymore. Or I had to shut, when, like you have to set a boundary with your grandmother. I was like, wait, granny, I got to do this with you. You're, you're an elder. I don't want to, I don't want to have to tell you no. I don't want to have to tell you that it has to look a certain way. But when I learned to do it with those people, those are the hardest people. It was able, I was able to kind of be, begin to figure out how to do them even in a broader scope beyond the family, right? Yeah, I like this one about the oxygen mask where you put it on first. Um, so put your oxygen mask on first. You can love and help others better when you are taken care of. So something that I learned when I started traveling with my daughter is I would always use that analogy and um, or that example in therapy, right? Like when you're trying to get people to take care of themselves, you're always like, oh, what do they do on a plane? And this is why they do it. And you help make the connection. When I became a mom and I started traveling with my daughter, I don't know if other mothers or yeah, it's all women, other mothers have noticed this, but they come up to you as the parent. So they do the little general like, hey, put your if the mask come down, you put yours on first before you help someone else. But they come to you like the flight attendants will come to the row and like, um, hey, mom, in case you didn't hear that, if the oxygen mask come down, put yours on first before you can put before you put it on your daughter. And like the first time it happened, I'm like, oh, maybe that's just a one time thing. But they do it every time. And I think that is such a powerful like reinforcement of I can't help my daughter if I put her mask on and now I'm without oxygen. And, you know, like, what is she going to do? I shouldn't say it that way, but like she can't help me in the same ways that I can help her. But I think it's just 
a strong reminder of we have to take care of us first then you can sort of pour and give and help others. So I always think about that when I'm traveling now, because a part of me would always be like, yeah, of course I'm going to give it to her first. But the reminder keeps me on check. Indeed, indeed. Mm -hmm. And so I have started to see some things in the chat specific to what strategies have been helpful for you as it relates to self-care and being intentional about self-care and really acknowledging like what are the things that get in the way for you? Um, so I'm wondering if people want to go ahead and drop in the chat, what are some of their favorite strategies for self-care? And I hope everyone has a pen and paper or, you know, a tab up to kind of begin to make a plan because our goal is to walk away with something today. We want you to walk away with the plan. And so um, a lot of times when we say self-care, again, we kind of think about this thing that we do on the weekends or the things we do once in a while. But I want to really stress that when we talk about self-care, this is something you do daily. This is something you do weekly. And this is something you plan for. And it doesn't have to be something that's going to take up your whole evening or your whole afternoon. This could be five minutes. This can be 10 minutes. I heard somebody say sitting in the car eating lunch. Like, I feel you, right? Like, sometimes I just need to be away from people. I know it's some memes that go around, like, the time you sit in the car just mm -hmm. before walking in the house. That is my self-care. Like, just give me a moment, right? Like I'm, I'm preparing myself. I see taking a walk or reading, therapy, journaling, journaling, utilizing aromatherapy, specifically lavender and peppermint, absolutely, to relax and unwind. The big no, yes, or I can't. Or my favorite is, that sounds really interesting. Let me get back to you and let you know. I love giving myself a pause to kind of be able to say, if I say yes to that, what am I actually saying no to? right? A good long shower, taking a walk, a bath, a new movie at a theater, solo, prayer, massages, chiropractor visits, getting away, walking in nature. Schedule I love your this one with schedule yourself for self-care because sometimes you can get so busy that you forget. And so if you put those things in place where it's either you're scheduling something or you're adding it to your calendar or you're setting that time aside, it sort of makes it, it holds you accountable to making sure that you're doing those things for yourself. Hiking has been, I agree with that a hundred percent. Hiking has been so therapeutic, taking time to do what I want, maybe alone or maybe spending time with someone who makes me laugh, working on um, puzzles and just relaxing. So one comment says, this is a different idea of self-care on daily. Um, and the way we sort of think about self-care is like you have those things that are like, like you were saying before, Danielle, like the bubble baths and all of those things, or you schedule like the massage, or you might do hiking on the weekend. But when you're thinking about yourself, it's almost like you have to use pour into yourself every day. And so it doesn't have to be those big things all the time. But what are some of those little things that you can do daily for you? And this is just the way that you can, I look at it as like a check-in with myself, um, sort of like, you know, asking myself the question in so many ways, like, what do I deserve today? How am I putting that space into me today? And so something that I do daily is I wake up, and this is just me, but I wake up earlier than my daughter because I say it all the time. I don't like waking up in the busyness of someone else. So I don't like waking up and immediately jumping into work jumping into um, parenting or whatever I have to do for the day. So for me, it's like having that little bit of time to me to just check in with my body. Like, did I sleep well? What am I feeling? What do I need to do today? You know, that's where I watch my reality TV. That's where I do whatever it is for me. And the other thing that I do is I work out in the mornings because it get, that's like my time for myself. So it's something very little it's not costing me money, it's really just time. And I do the same thing at the end of the day, like having that space to disconnect, having that quiet time so I can even check in with, what am I even thinking? Because sometimes I'm on a go, go, go that I forget. So it's like, what am I thinking? What am I feeling? What do I need in this moment? That's where I'm going to light my candles. I'm going to have my incense going. You know, I'm having a glass of wine if I want it. I'm going to watch TV. I'm going to do whatever it is, but you have to be able to check in and not put it off to make sure you're sort of keeping yourself going. Yeah, I absolutely love that. And I love the, the different strategies that are coming up in the chat. Um, one thing that I, that I can relate to is, is turning my work phone off and not checking it at night. 
I took my work email off my, my phone and it was amazing. It's like I get to control when I'm going to, to read and see what's needed because I feel like there's always something needed, right? And like that can be a, a never ending to do list. Um, morning quiet time is definitely, you know, really helpful and thinking about sometimes people struggle with that. Like there are different apps as we think about like Calm as an app or just different meditation apps to kind of help you, um, you know, facilitate that for yourself. I see shutting social media off. It gets deleted every now and then for me just to be like, I need a, I need a break or I need a cleanse. There's also an artist. Um, her name is Tony Jones. And she has a range of different like affirmations that I love. Like one is like, no is bae, right? Like no is a strategy for people. And it's like, I'll just listen to different things in the morning. And it's like a nice little beat and stuff to it. But it's also reminders. I think one is called worth ethic instead of work ethic in the sense that we're not just about what we can produce. We're not just about productivity. There's other things that matter for us as women. Um, and I think having those things in your world and those affirmations in your world that remind you of this kind of keep you keep you grounded and keep you steady. Another thing that I've, I've grown to do and one of my favorite, oh yeah, people know about Tony Jones, I love it. Um, one of my favorite things to do is like when I can in my schedule, I'll intentionally schedule a morning or maybe even a whole day where I do not make scheduled plans simply because I like it to be that I can check in with my body in the moment and see what I need. Do I want to go out and hang out with friends or do, do a brunch or do I really kind of just want to sit in quiet or maybe read a book or take a walk? Like I get to decide as I go instead of constantly being on a schedule and constantly having to, to show up for a particular set of things or people or responsibilities. Like sometimes I just want to show up to myself. And that's it. I don't want to have to show up to anybody else. And so that's harder to do, right, in the lives that many of us live. But in the moments in which you can or in the days that you can, like, just kind of take a break and take off, not necessarily filling it up with a bunch of things or tasks or responsibilities, but giving yourself space to say, I'm going to decide on that day what feels good for me. And that be the 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 meter, right? I, I've heard someone say, like, I want joy to be my meter for for what makes sense for for my time or for my attention or my energy, right? Mm -hmm. What brings me joy instead of what brings me acc accolades or what can I accomplish, et cetera. Define your meter. I love that. And again, that's something we deserve. Like we get to take control of it. That's how we get our power back. It's like we get to define what it is we're doing what we want, how we even measure that meter um, or what our meter is, like that's our power right there. I love, I hope you all are like taking note because I'm like looking at some of these things like, okay, this is good. Making sure you're like, these are all the ways that you can take care of yourself, the things that you can incorporate, whether it's daily. You can also think about it like across a week. So um, there might be those little things you do daily, but then if you're looking at your week, how many days or, you know, are there things you want to do across the week? How many times during the week do you want to do it? If you're looking at a month, what does that look like? So you want to think of it both in like that immediate, the short term, and then longer term, what does taking care of you look like? Um, and so if you're not able to, I think like something that you're saying Dr. Busby with uh, having those times that are just for you where you don't have to worry about like answering to anyone else. You know, you can always think about are there times where you can schedule that? Is that possible for you when the kids go to school or no one's in the house? Like, could you take off from work or are there days that you're off that you can pour into yourself in that way? And that gives you a chance of really listening to you. And I think that the more we listen to ourselves, we get to know ourselves that we have that space for us then we're better informed about what it is that we even need. Because the truth of it is so many people end up in therapy and they're like, I don't even know, like if I don't even know what I need to say what I need. And that's about how do we get back in touch with us so that you can, you will know those things. And that's a, a constant thing that we're all working towards. And I saw um, a comment that says, schedule your self-care right now, right? iPhone, Android, or writing it on your wall calendar be it 15 minutes or an hour. And so I'm wondering if people could take a moment in this moment and think about, are there one, is there a particular time during the week, one time, two times, maybe even three times during the week that you can think about really being intentional about one self-care strategy. I know we've listed a lot of different things today. 
Um, and I hope that you've gotten a lot of different ideas about what that can look like. Sometimes it can just be the quiet time in the morning. Sometimes it's going for a run. So you want to be able to schedule a little bit more time for that, right? And so if you were to think about your own week, what days would probably be best? What part of the day? And what do we need to do to allow that to make to, to happen, right? So I know when we talked about what gets in the way, like time, like what does it mean to wake up a little earlier, right? Or what does it mean to kind of get some additional support maybe from your partner or from a friend if you have to think about childcare? Um, just so we can really be intentional and this doesn't have to be a theoretical conversation that's out here, but it's a practical conversation that we're gonna change things about our behaviors so that we can actually make this something that we receive and give ourselves because we deserve it. To find your meter and teach others what that means for you and your relationship with them. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And maybe it doesn't even, as you kind of take your notes and think about a particular time um, of day, but maybe it's, it's a conversation you need to have about a particular boundary that will allow you to have more energy and, and take up less space, right? Yes. I want to have all of these techniques and strategies be a way of being and not have to set time out for them. Absolutely. And something that you all can do, um, this is something I have people do in therapy a lot. I do it for myself as well. But you can, as you're thinking about self-care, like you, there are so many strategies and things that people are doing that they're putting in the chat, write them down. But also for yourself, sort of like think about when you're feeling like at peace, when you are feeling joy, when you're feeling like, you know, that was a great workout or I really accomplished something in that moment. When you set a firm boundary, what were you doing? What was the activity? What was the time of day? What made it possible? And start to like write your list out based on those things. So I know like for myself, I love yoga on the weekends. I don't know why. It's like my weekend thing. But I know when I do yoga, how I feel. I know the time of day I want to do it. I know... I know what sense I want to have going in the house since we're in this COVID world or whatever we're dealing with. Um, and I know what it feels like to both do it and to be able to like do a pose that I couldn't do, like the accomplishment that comes from that. I know what I feel like afterwards. And I feel like that's sort of my drive to continue to do it. And so as we begin to think about self-care, it has to be things that you kind of like, okay, I feel good when I do that. I like, love how I feel. I'm not worried when I'm doing that. And those are the things you want to make sure you're doing more of and adding more of. And as we think about how do we shift to like, we don't have to set time. It just becomes a way of living. It's like you start with these small things and then eventually it's like it becomes a non-negotiable. So it is your way of living. It's like, it is no way I'm going back to putting everybody else first and leaving me in the back seat. And I felt like that's what I, you know, got from COVID is that I didn't realize when they made us shut down and it was like, I couldn't do all the things. It was like, wait, the way I was living wasn't even serving me. I was waking up early, rushing to get ready for the day, getting my daughter to school at work all day, rushing back home, cook dinner. And then it's, you sit down and it's all over. And I said, there is no way I will ever be able to go back to that. Like, I'm, that's a non-negotiable. I'm never doing that again. And so I think of our self-care in the same way. The more you do it, the easier it becomes. And then it becomes a thing of, there's no way I'm ignoring me. Sorry. Or I'm not really sorry, but you know, right. I'm not really sorry, but I'm not. Yeah. And I really like that idea of like, how can we make those small behaviors in our routines, right? Mm -hmm. So what does that look like for us? And if people are kind of taking notes or thinking about their week specifically, thinking about like, how can you change up your routine just a little bit so that it is incorporating the things we're talking about with greater ease, right? And the more you practice anything, the more, like the easier it is for you to actually make this a part of your life and not this thing that's separate or, you know, kind of this like like unique time, like this is the routines that I have to kind of continue to be well. In the same way, you know, we have to make sure we eat 
at certain times of day. I know even that's a self-care thing for me. Sometimes I would, especially when virtual world used to, ha- used to first start happening, I would just be going meeting to meeting to meeting and forget to eat. And then I'm wondering, why am I irritated? Why am I snappy with people that I'm normally not that snappy with? It's like, because Daniel, you need food. That's an essential. And so in the same way we need food to kind of fuel our body, we need rest points. We need points that bring us joy. We need things that kind of make us feel the way you, you said, Nicole, about yoga. Like, I love yoga as well as like a release. Like, I hold tension and stress in my body, even when I'm unaware of it. And the more I can do to release those things, whether it's deep breathing, whether it's yoga, whether it's a walk, I'm better because of it, right? And it's truly a a lifestyle change. And so now in the same way, when I block a meeting on my calendar for work, I'm not going to just let you know, someone say, hey, come do this instead of going to my meeting and work. It's the same way we have to treat the time that we set out for ourselves. It's like, yeah, no, I can't go do that. Instead, I'm, I'm, I'm booked. I'm busy at that time. Like I have time set aside for me. Mm -hmm. Someone told me because during the virtual world, I did get caught up in like the yes, 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 for a little bit, a little tiny bit, because I was at home. And so people were having all of these asking is like, oh, I don't have to drive. I guess I can do it. I'm, I'm here. And someone said to me, um, he said, every time you say yes, you have to ask yourself, what are you saying no to? And then you have to ask yourself, is it worth that? And sometimes, you know, the no might be you're saying no to rest. You're saying no to time with your daughter. Can you put a value on that? And it just shifted so much of what I was thinking because I thought like, oh, I'm doing these things, but it's like, what am I giving up every time I say yes? And you truly have to think about that. Like, what am I sacrificing to do this thing? And if it's sacrificing you, your happiness, your quiet time, um, it could be you doing a self-care activity. It could be you spending time with your family. Is it worth it? And then you begin to feel more comfortable because sometimes it is uncomfortable to say no. Like the truth of it is boundaries are hard because it's uncomfortable, but maybe you begin to feel more comfortable with it. Like it is not worth me losing this. So no, the answer is no and feeling okay with that. And so that's something that I still sort of play for myself. What am I giving up if I say yes to this? And I think you bring up a really good point that it doesn't necessarily have to be something bad, right? Like a lot of times when there are opportunities that are coming your way and it's things that are exciting happening or an opportunity to do something cool, it doesn't have to be a bad thing you're saying no to. It's just, it's still a time suck that is changing the dynamic of what you have to then give up, right? And so I had to learn that too, that just because it was an opportunity or something that I deemed to be positive, it, it's like you can only have so many of those because this other stuff is just as necessary as well, right? And so I think sometimes it's like, oh, I'm saying, you know, no to toxic people. It's like, no, it could be to your favorite humans that you genuinely enjoy hanging out with. Like, I love these people and I need time alone, right? And I need to rest more. And it doesn't have to equal this is bad and this is good because I think sometimes we create that narrative in our minds as well. Mm-hmm. All right. So I was thinking that another good use of our time, if everyone would be willing to join, would be for us to be able to have the opportunity to practice what a brief self-care strategy can look like. And so um, I know we, you know, we all have our different strategies for quiet time, for meditation. Um, but this is a strategy, a, a deep breathing, guided deep breathing activity that I often do with families, with kids, with adults, um, as a way to kind of show, it can literally take us five minutes to kind of slow down and check in. Um, And so I wanna invite you all to do that process with me today. I I see a comment that says, making yourself a priority is hard to do when you're used to taking care of others. I totally agree, absolutely. And that's why we're gonna practice it, right? Anything we begin to practice, if we practice it long and hard enough, we get better at it. And so. It's kind of like making that shift, right? Having a new way of kind of approaching things and thinking about what does it mean to not always put everyone else first, but put ourselves first because we love them too, right? I love me. I love you. I'm going to take care of myself so that when I'm with you and in your presence, I'm a better version of me, right? And so that's really going to be important. So I want to invite everyone to potentially, I hope you're sitting in a comfortable position, a comfortable place maybe have your back up against some sort of sturdy 
or you know comfortable space and we're going to start a guided deep breathing activity um, where we're going to start with three deep breaths we'll go into the guided meditation and then we'll end with three deep breaths and then dr um Kamak will finish with uh a really important affirmation and so i want to invite everyone to kind of get into their positioning whatever you need to do to get ready and kind of check in and be intentional about this space. And I'm going to invite you to close your eyes, but it's totally up to you. And we're going to start by taking a deep breath in. And then we're going to push it out. We're going to take a deep breath in. Push it out. Gonna take our final deep breath in, push it out. Now I want you to imagine a really bright white light is at the very top of your head. And this bright light is gonna slowly float down our body. It starts by slowly floating down the top of your forehead and it rests just above your eyebrows. Are you holding any tension here? What does it feel like? Can you let it go? Now the same bright light continues to float past your eyes the tip of your nose, what do you notice? And it continues to float past your lips, all the way to your chin. How are you holding your jaw? Are you holding any tension there? Can you let it go? And the same bright light continues to float past your throat, across your shoulders. What do your shoulders feel like? Are you holding them in a particular way? Let it go. And now the same bright light floats past your heart all the way to the top of your belly button. How are you holding your stomach? Can you let it go? And it continues to float past your thighs and to your knees. How do your legs feel? And it continues to float down your shins and it lands on the top of your feet. What do your ankles feel like? How do your legs feel? And it continues to float to the very soles of your feet. Now we're gonna end just the way we began with those three deep breaths. Take a deep breath in Let it out. Take a deep breath in. Let it out. Take your final deep breath in. Let it out. Whenever you're ready, I invite you to open your eyes, kind of reposition yourself back to our space.
Okay. And I, we wanted to close with the Black Women Deserve Affirmation um, as part of the conference, but we just wanted to reiterate that because we want us all to remember not only what we deserve to sort of speak it, to name it, to affirm it within ourselves, to believe it, to sometimes we might say it and we don't believe it, but to keep saying it until we do. And so we'll give you the shorter version, but it's a part of the conference materials. Black women deserve to live, to thrive, to prosper, to be healthy, whole, and free. Black women deserve to flourish in a world that honors our humanity, to be valued, respected, and protected. Um, and you can think about, I'm sure you've been thinking about it throughout the conference and today, but um, you know, what can you commit to, to creating a world that Black women deserve, that you deserve, um, and how do you affirm and give yourself those things throughout your day-to-day? -day? just want to thank you on behalf of all the uh, folks joining us here today. I just want to thank you, Dr. Danielle, Dr. Nicole. This is exactly what we needed. We were blessed by your presence, by setting intentions for ourselves. Now, remember, wherever you wrote down those intentions, or if, like Mary said, if you put them in your phone, if you put them on your calendar, do what it is you need to do to take care of yourself um, and speak life over yourself, like the affirmation says. Super grateful for you all. Thank you so much uh, for the time that you've spent with us. We hope to stay connected with you um, as you grow your practice. And we are looking forward to seeing wonderful things from you. Uh, and now we are going to move into a little musical interlude. So stay put, everybody. We're about to hear some amazing music from DJ M. White. Take it away. 